The man himself, Seymour Hersh, a Pulitzer Prize winning American investigative journalist, dropped a bombshell in an online expose early February saying that the Biden administration masterminded the explosions which destroyed the Nord Stream pipelines. He cited an anonymous source with direct knowledge to the operational planning for which he was criticized as uh, this is a small piece of uh, information to back up a huge story. After weeks of Relative silence in response to his reporting, mainstream international media started to ask more questions. Finally, on March the 7th, the New York Times, for the first time in a month, talked about the subject, suggesting that a quote-unquote pro-Ukrainian group was behind the sabotage. How reliable is Hirsch's source? How does he defend his story? Why his apparent dista distaste in the IQ and moral standards of the Biden team? And what does he think of the latest New York Times? Report. Welcome to a special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined from Washington, D.C. by Seymour Hersh himself. Mr. Hersh, thank you very much for joining us. So we start with the very latest. As I said, there was this latest piece on The New York Times, which alleges that new intelligence reviewed by U.S. officials suggests that a pro-Ukrainian group carried out the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines last year. And you laughed at the report, calling it one of the worst covers stories you've ever heard from that administration. What do you mean by that? Well, what I actually said to some people was, I always thought the uh, the operation uh, came from Somalia, <laughs> you know, af after that story. Um, th there's some ironies, of course, there's always irony in life, but the story that you mentioned also had no name sources. <laughs> so there you are. I spent, let's see, I spent eight years, seven, eight years working for the New York Times writing stories about the CIA and some very special stories about spying on America, their own, our own citizens, about uh, intervening in the, in the Chile, the election of the, Mr. Allende in Chile, all sorts of stuff. And I would say of, uh, of the thousand stories I wrote, maybe 95% did not name the sources because there were people inside the government that you just can't put in the middle. And in this story, I was even more constrained. What I said was a source with, with, direct, with information about what happened, which makes it almost impossible, I would think, for the, the people who like to investigate leaks to find out where. That could have, been, that met, could have left thousands of people. But you think it's, it's not possible for, the, for a pro-Ukrainian group to carry out this, uh, this explosion? Um, it doesn't matter what I think. I, I, I know that... Um, uh, the few things I know about the Ukrainian Navy is they are capable of dropping mines. Remember, there was a period when they mined the harbor, I think, in Odessa, until we, it was finally agreed that certain ships with grain could, could, could um, go back and forth. Um, <clears throat> but they don't have any real, you know, as, as far as I understand, and, and I'm not an expert on it. I just happened to ask questions after that story came out. Um, they don't have a, a working de decompression chamber. So the, the divers, once they're down, when you go, when you're in in the ocean, you have to stop every 80 or 90 feet down. They went 260 feet down to adjust the breathing. You're 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 using a combination of oxygen, nitrogen, and helium mm -hmm. to stay, stay uh, to not avoid uh, too much nitrogen. And coming back, um, going down is slow, but coming back, if you want to just go straight up, you can if there's a decompression chamber. on the. So on basically the, you're the, saying you needed a lot of resources to carry out such a complicated operation, right? But we we also seen uh, large-scale attacks in the past which were carried out by non-state actors, but also uh, equally complicated, sophisticated, and very successful as well. Well, tell me what you're talking about. I'm talking about the 911 attacks, for instance. Oh, um, I, they were not. N I don't think you can compare 911 flying a plane into a building with what it takes to put C4, and that what we're talking about are four pipelines, Nord Stream 1 and 2, each have two. They're steel tubes covered by a concrete cover to protect themselves from the salinity, the, the, the um, salt in the water. So you have to have people that know, that are, are the experts in underwater diving and experts in using the most, the plastic C4, the most volatile stuff there is. And also they have to be able to go quick. They have to be sure they get the bomb, the bomb in the, 
their, their weapon and the bomb in the right place that triggers and destroys everything. And they have to practice like a, they practice for weeks and months on this, I would say, in the waters of the Baltic Sea. Uh, right close to Denmark and... Um, so you think it is with, way too complicated for any amateur diver groups to carry out this kind of an operation. Um, right now, of course, we're all talking about speculation, but the, the fact that the U.S. government officials leaked this intelligence to the New York Times at this particular moment, what do you think they're trying to send as a message? <clears throat> Don't make me say what you know they're trying to do. They're trying to, to divert attention from the story that I wrote, which included enormous specifics. I was describing a process that began before Christmas of 2021. It involved the, the, uh, the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, of the White House of the, uh, for the president. They had a series of meetings at a secret room in the White House uh, that I gave clues. I know the title of the room. The, the instructions that were given to the group when they were assembled, as I said, sometime in December of 2021, uh, Putin was organizing, already beginning to organize and shift troops to Belarus. But the point was to give the president some options, maybe to stop it. And what they were asked to do, and the language here is really interesting, they were asked to come up with both reversible and irreversible um, concepts, ideas. Um, uh, a reversible concept would have been more sanctions. Something irreversible would have been kinetic, uh, a bomb. And eventually it turned out that what they really wanted was to put down the pipelines. And you can't have the kind of language I have in there without scaring the hell out of some people in the White House because that was the language used. Well, this is um, the question a lot of people have. I mean, this is an outrageous idea if you think about it. Um, I, I wonder what, what was your impression when you first heard such um, detailed language confirming the suspicion on the mind of a lot of people that the U.S. Behind, was behind it. It's an act of terror to destroy the critical infrastructure of an airline of the United States. Is the United States so reckless? Is the current Biden administration so reckless to carry out something like that? Um, um, those are questions uh, above my pay grade because all I'm doing is I'm describing an operation and for which um, um, the White House was told, the, the people involved came up with the idea, one of the options could be to destroy the pipelines. That was a far out idea. But you have to know that um, since the 1960s, in the beginning of the, when the American policy of containment about all things communist, uh, certainly in Asia too, um, and particularly explains the Vietnam War, more or less. We were trying, we, if we stopped it there, we could, you know, prevent who knows what, the takeover of Australia. I don't know what the planning was. But the notion of containment um, had a problem because from the very beginning, Germany in particular, in the 60s, and when Jack Kennedy even uh, was commenting about that, were buying gas at a very cheap price and oil from Russia. There weren't any direct pipelines. They went through the Ukraine in the beginning. Uh, but the concern of America, and it's the same concern that was expressed before and after this, even publicly after right. the, uh, uh, which is that Russia was weaponizing gas. And that's the theme that went from the 60s all the way, and certainly in the Bush-Cheney years, uh, Condoleezza Rice, there's some wonderful footage of her yeah. uh, bemoaning the power. And certainly in this government, the concern was always been that as long as Germany was getting so much gas at such a cheap price from Russia, that it would be very hard to wean them away from Russia. And so it, we had a situation, I'll just finish this, we had a situation in which there were two pipelines. The first pipeline, Nord Stream 1, was, um, began operations in 2011. And for, that, for the next 10 years, Germany had the more gas than they could use. They were retailing it themselves. Of course. Yeah, I understand. I mean, this is a concern which has been on the mind of the U.S. government for decades. But, but to, to actually think about taking it out using bombs, that is taking it really a big step forward. Um, the, the image would be terrible. The U.S. image would be terribly tarnished. The, the trust in the mind of its allies would be terribly damaged if this ever comes out. And this, you cannot prevent uh, that it comes out one day because there might be a, 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 however small, might be a group of people who know about it as it happened with you, with your story. So the risk is huge. And yet the Biden administration really decided to take this very risky step. You think it's, it's possible? I mean, for a lot of people, it's just uh, hard to fathom. Well, all I know is what I wrote, which is that the initial plan 
the, the concern was you're going to do use divers to trigger. Um, it's not a, it's it's a, it's not a bomb. It's a mine to trigger a, a mine underwater mine, and you're going to use them in the Baltic Sea where there is no oil. So how can a bunch of divers suddenly start going down? So they really had to work. The problem was always fraught with cover. They didn't have enough cover. But there was an exercise that the U, that NATO does in the Baltic um, in the Baltic Sea every summer. Baltic Sea is huge. The pipeline we're talking about goes from outside of Leningrad all the way to, to Germany, 750 miles. Um, uh, and two of them is 1,500 miles of pipes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so it's a big problem. It's just not something you can do at a minute's notice. We have a longstanding relationship with Norway. The, uh, the United States, the Norwegians worked very closely with us in the early days of Vietnam, uh, doing operations with our American SEALs inside the North Vietnam before the war was declared. So we have a long-standing relationship with them, and we went to them right away. And I think the number of people that were involved in this was f much fewer than you can guess. It didn't take much. The Norwegians provided the ships. Uh, the United States had the skill. We were able to find the two best Navy divers in the, you know, the, the best ones we could find, mm -hmm. who never talked there. And um, so you had a couple of divers. You had some people from the intelligence agencies. You had the Norwegians. Uh, the ship used was a Norwegian, um, what they call alter class minesweeper. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's just that the, the technology of triggering a bomb underwater, if you want to wait for it, is very complicated. But you have called also a part of the, uh, called this uh, planning uh, stupidity, you know, and you, on several occasions, you laughed at the intelligence level of the Biden administration. By the way, it is quite, uh, you know, confusing, Im implicating itself when Biden made the public threat to put an end to Nord Stream 2. Why do you have such apparent discontent? Or, or I'm, not <laughs> I'm just not questioning their intelligence. These are all people, uh, Tony Blinken and uh, the Secretary of State, uh, the one who didn't go to China because to meet his counterpart because of a balloon. Yeah. And Jake Sullivan, who is the National Security Advisor, all have high degrees right. and the, the Undersecretary for State, plenty of intelligence. It's just what they're so driven by, I think, um, um, uh, uh, hatred of all things, particularly Putin and also communism per se. They're so cold warriors. They're really out of sorts. And it makes them do dumb things like like uh, I will tell you, the people from the intelligence community were appalled by what happened and horrified. They thought it was useless. What he did was what Biden did is by triggering the mine in late September, he was worried the war, the war in Ukraine was a big deal for Biden. And I think American presidents, there's a history of American presidents. The most popular and beloved ones were, were uh, Lincoln for the war he won in the Civil War, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt for the war he won in World War II, winning a war against an adversary. And I don't know, I don't know, Mr. Biden. I, I think his social programs are great. I, th I just think his foreign policy is to complete idiocy, alienating a lot of people around the world. Russia has made more friends in, in, the, in the third world uh, over since this began than anybody in this administration seems to appreciate. So this notion of American uh, hegemony, if you will, it just doesn't work anymore. And so that's what I object to. Hmm. I also object to the fact that what is the end game? You know, right now, I don't know what he wants. Um, does he want to go and mix it up with Russia eventually? Does he want to keep on going? If he runs into trouble, which he will this winter. I mean, uh, winter's over, but he's certainly there's going to be an offensive zone. Uh, everybody I know uh, in the intelligence community, including some people, I, I've been around 50 years. I've been, by the way, I've been doing stories like this without sources right. foryver. But any, I'm just going to finish the thought. Everybody I know does not see a positive outcome. So the Biden fear, obviously, in late fall, last fall, was that if it gets bad, and he still wants more support from NATO and particularly from Germany and Western Europe. And they begin to say, hey, so he, you know, he wanted to secure more support, reluctant as it is, by cutting off the pipeline. Is that forget about Russian gas? What it is, the pipeline, the second pipeline, the first pipeline was stopped by Putin. So he controlled it. That's Nord Stream 1. The second one was a brand new one that was finally a commission. It was ready to go by the end of 2001, early 2022, right. rather. And Chancellor Schultz obviously under pressure from us, 
uh, 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 sanction it, stopped it. With all the gas, the reason there was so much gas, it was filled with gas, 750 miles of gas, methane gas. And the fear in the White House, clearly, it seems to me, I, you don't have to be, I, I, I'm, I, I make it, I put this on me, but I know this is the thought of some of the people in the operation. The fear was that uh, at some point, uh, when winter, winter's coming, uh, that um, uh, Chancellor would remove the sanctions and start using the keep his businesses going, mm -hmm. the factories going. Germany's a very mercantile country and would um, uh, keep his people warm. And um, and so what Biden did was kept him from that option. In other words, he, 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 he couldn't go back to that. So he would need us maybe more and maybe uh, go, go back to trying to support. I don't know what the thinking was, but whatever it is, I can tell you, for all the lack of interest among the major newspapers in New York, in America, right. I've been flooded. Well, I've been flooded with people from Europe, the Bundestag, the Parliament. I've had. Yeah. Six, what eight, do you ten. What do you make of the apparent lack of interest in the in the mainstream media in in in, in the well, United States? I think there's a. I think the Trump years really terrified the American liberals and the left, if you will. They they were ter terrified. And you had a situation where there was Fox News on one side and the New York Post conservative papers favorable to Trump. And the rest were absolutely against anything, uh, all things Trump. And I think that the, the fallout is now they have a Democrat uh, who largely won because he wasn't Trump. I mean, there was nothing mm -hmm. that overwhelmingly appealing. He's a decent man, I'm sure. I don't I don't know him at all. Mm -hmm. And I was in Congress for many years. So the newspapers are just the thought. I mean, I got to tell you. The Den Democrats, when I was doing stuff on Vietnam, a lot of, I did the My Lai Massacre right. stories and all those things. When I did that, the Democrats in the, in the Congress were absolutely for the kind of stuff I was doing against the Vietnam War. And many re moderate Republicans were. Now, the Democrats are dead set supporting Ukraine. The idea that the, the, the head of the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer from New York, the, the, the majority leader, would convene a meeting to discuss uh, what's going on with this policy? It just doesn't exist. Congress pretends it didn't happen either, but that is my story. Didn't happen. Not one congressman from the left or the moderate Democrats have talked to me. Right. When in days before they would, I used to go and brief sometimes in private some of the leaders. So basically, you're saying this is campaign politics. This is um, partisan politics uh, uh, on the subject of uh, Nord Stream pipelines. This is also about being renominated again too. It's not just it's partisan politics in the broad sense, but in the narrow sense for the president, I think if he can pull, pull out the rabbit in the hat in Ukraine, which he's not going to do, um, uh, the newspaper coverage of the Ukraine war has been totally distorted by, by the, the White House, period. It's not, it's, it's not going well. So basically you're saying the New York Times, for instance, you describe it as your paper, is um, not really doing a journalistic job on the subject. <laughs> The stuff I see in the paper constantly, constantly being fed to them by the White House did happen. I worked there in the 70s. But, you know, those are halcyon days. We had the, we had the Vietnam War was going badly. Nixon was caught up in Watergate, the scandals. Mm -hmm. And I, there, I, could, I was writing about anything I wanted. I had total freedom in that paper for seven, eight years. It was a luxury you cannot believe. It's a very powerful paper. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, and so the same, I went to work at the New Yorker. Things were great as long as Bush and Cheney were in. But once a Democrat gets in, things get harder because the papers are naturally liberal. Their audience is liberal. I see. They also hate, 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 oh. uh, hate it. Yeah. I'm very curious about the source that talked to you, Mr. Hirsch. I don't know how much you can talk about that, but. Yeah. Uh, I've uh, never, I've been in business for 50 years and written a yeah. lot of stories. Yeah, I don't want you to mention, of course, I don't want yeah. you to name your it's source, true. but what was the consideration that you do? What's the kind of work you do before you decide to publish a story based on one single source? I mean, the New York Times, for instance, they have their work judging whether a source is reliable. How do you judge whether your source was reliable? You know, I'll tell you something about my country. Um, because of what I did in Vietnam, a lot of young, a lot of people that became three and four generals, star generals and leaders in the intelligence community worked in Vietnam up to 75. And so when the writing I did about Vietnam, very critical, including about massacres that everybody covered up, um, always stuck with them. And so they move on in life and by the 80s, they become one star generals and then they go on, they retire maybe 2010 and they stay on some in the government, particularly in intelligence communities. And the one thing the people that gravitate to me are, they're people who take the oath of office 
in, in, when they were at a high level, after anything above enlisted, as an officer in the military and in the State Department and the CIA and the National Security Agency, you take the oath of office, mm-hmm. I think, every year. And when you take that oath, they're not taking it to their boss or the colonel or the general mm-hmm. or, or to the president. They're taking it to the Constitution. And those are the people that talk to me. There were people who were profoundly upset. They were willing to do what the president asked them to do. They thought they were going to give him some assets, the notion that he could destroy him and let the, con- communicate that to Russia as an effort to stop it. Once that didn't happen, once the Russians attacked, the only, there was just no reason to do what he did except out of fear that he might have to, he might have to prevent Europe from walking away because of Russian gas. Mm-hmm. That's always been a sub-theme. And I will tell you that Biden himself chaired a committee and was involved as a vice president. Right. Yeah, let's, let's focus on the, on the source because I'm really interested. And that's one of the reasons why people attack you, attacks you on this or uh, questions your, no, your no, credibility. It's no, no, it's not because they're attacking me because of me and the source. They're attacking me because of what the story says. Right, of course. But uh, again... If I wrote a single source say about something wonderful that happened in the Biden administration that nobody knew about, I wouldn't be attacked. <laughs> I would, it would be all over the, the papers. What do, you think would be the, what do you think would be the reaction or the, or the level of coverage uh, by these papers if, uh, if such a thing is suspected on a country that's considered to be a threat to the United States? Oh, my God. Uh, if you're obviously talking about something called China. <laughs> and I noticed that the very tough talk by one of your senior officials about America the other day was not carried in the papers. Maybe it was. I didn't see it on page one and uh, up prominently. So we're in a, we're in a, a question where the, the Democrats are sort of hunching, hugging, hugging each other, hoping we can win the House. We've lost the House, hoping we can carry and win the Senate. But right now the polls show that the, where there seems to be a lot of support for the war in Afghanistan, and uh, there I am, for the war in Ukraine, Ukraine, but more than 60% of the public, if they asked about the mm-hmm. money we're spending, $113 billion, you could put everybody in America in a home mm-hmm. that doesn't have one for $100 billion. Yeah. We're spending $113 billion. They, 62% said no. He's losing this, the, the war popularity auto- automatically. My personal view is... Um, I don't want to see us be antagonistic to Russia and China. Mm-hmm. I think that's crazy. It's counterproductive. And I think it's also, they make it personal. They don't make it professional. Mm-hmm. I mean, somebody wagged his face, yeah. you know, it's one of your officials. Um, you, you cited in one of the interview on BBC many, four years ago, that you actually wanted to be an editor. So when you were publishing on the online platform, who is your editor? Well, no, wait a second. No, what I always said about editors is, um, I want Eddie. I, I worked at the New York Times and I saw who was promoted. That's really a misstatement because I know what I've always said. If 90% of the editors were dismissed tomorrow, the world would be better off. <laughs> and so, what I do, Substack, what happens is Substack is sort of like self publishing, only it's, it's more than that, but it's quite vibrant in terms of the people that attend how, it because of. Yeah, my question well, really is how, how well, is there a second well, pair on. of eyes? Let me answer your question. Okay. Give me a chance. Because time is very well, limited. My time head. is my enemy. <laughs> well, you, you, can, you can always make this longer or shorter. <laughs> no, I don't want to because this is too good. Um, yeah, but the thing is, my question really is how do you. How do you. Not, per, yeah. Go ahead. How do you. I, how do I you, use the editors, the editor I use now was the editor when I wrote a whole bunch of series of stories for the London Review of Books, which certainly has amazing... So you have editor. an editor who's overlooking well, what you're... who's checking. Series, an editor who is, has a prominent editor and quite well-known. Okay. And also, also a literary figure. And I use fact-checkers that All work right. for, the New Yorker, for the New Yorker okay. fact-checking. Which, good, uh, of good. course I do. Well, it's reassuring to know that. Um, you, this is also about the time where there is a 20-year anniversary of the Iraq War. I have to make it fast. Um, ten years ago, you wrote what you asked, "What about the Constitution?" Now, another ten years later, uh, what would you say to the situation? Constitution? What do you mean? <laughs> you wrote about. You wrote an article said Iraq ten years later. What about? I'm being facetious. What I'm, what, if okay, anything, sorry. If, you know, you're, you're dealing in a country where guns are being used every day. 
there's no there's no sense of you know I, I don't know quite where I love my country. I, I was my parents were immigrants. The first language was not was not English. I grew up poor. I worked when I was 13. Mm -hmm. I got a scholarship to a wonderful university, University of Chicago, where they use don't use textbooks. It was all it's all in it's self taught. Yeah. You learn to be you learn to be critical thinking is the thing that's very important. Mm -hmm. And so um, so and. Um, you have to also have to understand that I, I did the My Lai stories as a young man. I stuck two fingers talking about a massacre by American troops of 500 individuals raped and murdered and mutilated. Um, and it took me a long time to get it published because everybody denied it. I'm sticking two fingers in the eye of Richard Nixon. And I'm not in some gulag. I'm not put away. I, I'm fame, fortune, and glory. Uh, and so America is a special place in principle. What happens now is that um, I, and I blame Trump for this because he really, he really created a monster. Now, there's so much oh. fear mm -hmm. now that I, I just think the Constitution has been devalued by Trump. It's a terrible thing he's done. And, I, and um, as somebody who's got family and loves this country, uh, I think the only thing I can do, the best thing I could do, is be as nasty as I can when they're doing dumb things. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing now... There's no, this doesn't mean I love Putin. He started a war, the bloodiest war in, in Europe since 1945. We had, you know, we, we had the Balkans and we had the Chestnut, but this is really, a, so it's on him. I, admittedly, he was pushed, but it's on him to start it. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to have to figure out a way of, out of that. Yeah. But still, it's my country and I, it's going wrong. I get your point. Finally, uh, are you going to review more about the story? Are you going to write more on the story? And how do you think we can get to the bottom of it? Two minutes, well, please. Well, first of all, I write every week for my, my subset. I mean, about the subject. Will you have more revelations well, I'm coming? I'm writing quite a bit. Of, um, and, um, oh, no, they'll never admit it, this administration. So how do we get to the bottom of it? Final thought, okay? The President of the United States has a very immense power. It's called tasking. He can task the American intelligence community, which is quite good. There's an Office of National Intelligence, and they, they, they're the powers, and they have an intelligence office that's very competent. The CIA has a Directorate of Intelligence that's very, so very we'll competent. So we'll never find out. All he has to do is ask. Oh. Tell me what happened, and why do you think he doesn't ask? Okay. I'll tell you why he doesn't ask, and this is not me. These are people involved. He knows the answer, right. but he's Thank not going to tell the answer. Thank you so much. Time is very limited, but uh, it's oh, I have fun to talking to you. It's great. It was great to, to end yeah, very good informative. Argument. Thank you so <laughs> much. Thank you so much, Seymour Hersh, joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much. I take this seriously. I only laugh a lot, Thank but I do take it very Thank seriously. You. Of course, I understood. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Lucien. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lucien in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thanks for watching. You've got The Point.